Hey. Well, good evening. I mean, good morning. Whatever time of the day it is, how you doing? Blessed. As one of our members who no longer lives in, in the state uh, used to say, too blessed to be depressed. Amen? Amen. I, I, I want to tell you something. This evening is going to be a change from what we've been doing in the evening. We're studying the anatomy of a revived church. Uh, this evening, however, we're going to have the first installment, the first episode of this of this. Um, series called The Chosen. It's about the choosing of the disciples. And it'll be at five o'clock. You do not want to miss it. If it does not work in the fellowship hall, we'll be in here so you can watch it on these screens. So uh, plan to be here for that, five o'clock. You don't want to miss this. I promise you, I've watched all of the episodes and it's very, very stirring. An excellent thing. Well, we are in Luke. We're in chapter... Um, are we still in 18? Yeah, we're still in 18. Now I'm going to read some verses with you. You read with me, verses 18 through 23. This is our text, and I want us to follow this and talk this morning about a man who walked away from Jesus. Look at this passage of Scripture. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Father, teach us from the word of God. I ask that you be glorified. Thank you in Jesus' righteous name. Amen. You may be seated. Now I'm going to speak to you as I said, about the man who walked away from Jesus. And I'm sure you think this is an unbelievable thing, that someone would walk away from Jesus, but it happened. This man walked away. Now, listen to me. Let me tell you one more time about this man before we get into the text. He was young, he was rich, and he had power. Everything, every young man I've ever known has looked for, this young man had. Everything I've ever known about every human being on the face of the earth, this was true. Young ladies, I know you buy the rejuvenating creams. Don't get mad at me. I have three daughters and a wife. I know this. He was rich. And all of us think that's the American dream. And he was powerful. And this is a desire every human being has to be powerful. This man came to Jesus heard the claims of Jesus, and then walked away from Jesus. What a picture. You knew some people like that. You may know some people like that. It may be true about one of you if you were to share your testimony. Maybe somebody here would say, I was that person, but later in life, I came to the Lord. It could be true about you. It's entirely possible for this to be true about you. But when you saw someone walk away from Jesus, your heart hurt, didn't it? It just absolutely ached for you to know this. Maybe it was a family member. Maybe it was a son or daughter. Maybe it was a brother or a sister. Maybe one of your own children, but you saw it, and it amazed you 
and you're still perplexed, how could anybody walk away from Jesus? My goal is to tell you why this happened. At least in this story that we read, I'm going to tell you why it happened. And I want to show you this morning what the man wanted and what he did not want, what he had but could not have. I want you to see that. You see, this man wanted salvation. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wanted salvation, but he wanted it without sanctification, ladies and gentlemen. You remember that word sanctified, don't you? To be set apart for a specific purpose. Are you amazed this morning that God has a plan for your life? Hannah, God has a plan for your life. Your new life began, your true life began last Sunday when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. And God has a plan for your life. I want you to know that. Are you amazed that God can make life uh, uh, meaningful and full of purpose? He does that. He sets us apart for his purpose. You remember the old story of the of the auctioneer one day, and they made a song out of it as well, how he took a violin and he took that violin. Dr. Cooley, I should have just, I should have remembered that you had one in the office in there. I, I forgot. He took that violin and, and uh, he held it up. He said, you see this old violin? It's, it's really old. I don't know how much we could get for it. Do I hear a dollar for this thing? I hear two dollars for it. Three, who will give me three? Four. Then an old gentleman got up and he picked up the violin and the bow that was with it and he tightened the bow and he tuned the strings and he began to play the violin and he played it and the auctioneer looked on with amazement and the crowd looked on with amazement after he played a, a little bit on that violin, a short part of it, a short symphony, uh, concerto, when he did that, he handed it back to the auctioneer, and the auctioneer said, Do I hear $5,000? Ten, who'll give me ten? When the thing finally sold for several thousand dollars, somebody came up and said, I do not understand what happened here. And he said, It was the touch of the master's hand. I want to tell you something when you come to Jesus Christ. He touches your life, and there's a touch of his hand on your life. And part of the touch of the Lord Jesus' hand on your life is the fact that he sets you apart for the purpose of God. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that absolutely wonderful? Some of y'all are running from that today. You are. You want salvation, but you're not so sure about the being set apart for God's purpose. Well, let me, let me remind you of some things. That I'm not just saying this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3 says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification. That's how that verse begins. And among the things that this means is how we abstain from things uh, like immorality. We abstain from that. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The first message I ever preached in my life. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ladies and gentlemen, God offers us salvation, but with that salvation process is this word called sanctification. This man, however, was cemented to this present world. This is where he was. He was sorrowful when he walked away because he was cemented to this present world. One of the sadder verses in the Bible is in 2 Timothy when Paul is speaking and he's writing to Timothy and he speaks of one of his 
one of his men that had been by his side through a lot of things named Demas. And he says about Demas, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. Oh, what a sad thing, Demas. What a sad thing for you to do to Paul, Demas, in that moment. Demas was Lot's wife who looked with longing after her life in Sodom. He was Gehazi who saw the riches of Naaman. He was Balaam who looked for a, a way to compromise the plan of God. He was Cain offering the works of his hands. Demas was Eve who looked at the tree and he saw its fruit to be desirable. Oh, this present world has its desirability, ladies and gentlemen. Be careful if you're looking with longing at this present world. Be careful. You're going to be tempted to. Who among us has never been tempted to look at this present world? Watch out! Be careful. He couldn't be saved without sanctification, neither can you. So many of us want a ticket to ride, but we don't want where the train is going, just the final destination. So many of us want it that way. Why, if God had intended just to save you from hell and save you for heaven, why, he would have just snapped you right out of here in that moment. I'm telling you, the day you gave your heart to the Lord, that's what he would have done. I'm compelled to tell you something else about this man who walked away from Jesus. He had religion. He had religion, but he had no regeneration whatsoever. Jesus looked at him and says, you know the commandments. You know what they say. Let me tell you something. That's how his question began. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, ladies and gentlemen, religion is what man does trying to reach up to God. Every time, that's what it is. Sometimes when I don't know the person who, with whom I'm speaking and I'm witnessing to them, I'll ask them what their particular pastor will tell them about how to be saved. You go to church? Yeah, I go to church. How often you go to church? Oh, every once in a while. Well, when you go to church, what does your pastor say about how to be saved? What's he tell you to do? And I try to find out. You see, that's a worldview question where you're finding out what that person understands about the Bible. But it's also an exploratory salvation spiritual question where you're trying to reach to where that person is. Most of the time, the answer I get is, well, my pastor tells me do this or do that. Sometimes I'll ask them if what their neighbors say. Now, you, you got neighbors, don't you? Yeah, I got neighbors. If, if you were to ask them this question, what would they say to you? And I'll ask that question again. And they'll say, well, my, my neighbors would tell me to be honest and to do this and to do that. And, and then everything's going to work out in the end. And so Jesus pointed to these commandments he pointed, interestingly, if you look at this text, he pointed to the man's relationships with other people. Didn't mention God at all in there. Not one mention about it. It's all about his relationships with other people. In verse 20, you can see what I'm speaking about right there in the text. Well, what it is, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. All of these things. Now Mark adds a sixth commandment in there. Over in Mark chapter 10. He says do not defraud others. You see. Here's the interesting thing for you ladies and gentlemen. Religion. What you do. Is how the world sees religion. How you treat others. Is what the world thinks. Being saved is. Religion is outward. Regeneration is inward. You can be religious all day long and never be born again. You can be busy and not be born again. 
You can be a servant and not be saved. You can love people and not love God. You can be a professing believer, but not a possessing believer. It's possible. He had religion. He didn't have regeneration. I want to tell you something. Like this man right here, you can have conviction and still not have a conversion. <clears throat> I've seen this unfold too many times. Someone attends a funeral and they're convicted. Someone hears they have a major illness and they get convicted. Someone comes to the edge of death and they're convicted. Then comes along a new day. Then comes along a new moment and they say, Phew, I made it past this one and the conviction goes away after just a short period of time. I want to tell you what brought this man to Jesus. This man comes to Jesus, and I want to tell you what brought him to Jesus. Inwardly, it was the Holy Spirit who drew him. Look at verse 19 in this passage, if you would, please. Here in verse 19, the Bible says, Why do you call me good? There's none good. No one is good but one that is is God. Do you know what Jesus is asking when he asks that question? Do you know what he's asking? He's saying, Jesus is saying either Jesus is not good or he's God. And the implied question, are you confessing my lordship? Do you see that? Either he's no good at all, or he's God. Why do you call me good? Why do you do that? If there's only one good, there's no one good but God, why are you calling me good? That's an important question because that's what the Holy Spirit does, ladies and gentlemen. When you, when you come confronted with your need for salvation, the Holy Spirit shows you that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for your sins, and God raised him from the dead. That's what he does. And you know, outwardly speaking, this man may have seen some of the miracles of Jesus. He may have seen Jesus raise someone from the dead, and I wonder if he was there when Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I wonder if he was there then. I wonder if he heard that. I wonder if he was there when, when the, the discourse that I did not share with you about the return of the Lord that's in Luke 17. I wonder if he heard that. Interesting, right? I'm telling you, outwardly, this man saw evidences of the kingdom of God just like Nicodemus. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can't do it. A man or a woman will walk away from Jesus when that person wants rest, but not a relationship. Look over, please, in Matthew chapter 11. Let me show you those verses that you love to hear preached. In Matthew 11, we'll begin at verse 28 and what Jesus says here. Matthew 11:28, the Word of God says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Wow, there it is. This man wanted rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I have to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be tough to swallow, but that's all right. Um, sometimes we need to swallow it. Uh, yeah, you've had some of that medicine. It's just not good. 
You know what I'm saying? And you just start tearing up at the thought of having to swallow it. Um, the unsaved man, the unsaved woman, is an enemy of God. You think you're a friend of God. James 4.4 4 says friendship with this world is enmity with God. The word means warfare. You are, if you're not born again, if you've never been saved, if you've never trusted Christ Jesus, you are at war with God. If you love this world, and if you're trying to live to make the very, very best of this world above walking with Jesus Christ, if this is your priority, this world right here, you're at warfare with God. Yeah. And the unsaved man or the unsaved woman follows the prince of the power of the air. It's called being lost, being separated from God. And a lost person is restless until that person repents and believes the gospel. The wicked, Isaiah 57 verse 20, says, are like the troubled sea. David describes the man or the woman who cannot find rest over in Psalm 38. Just listen to the word of God for a moment, if you would please, and what he says in Psalm 38, verses 4 and 8. My iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. An unsaved person is restless in their heart, ladies and gentlemen. The unsaved person cries, I need rest! But won't take Jesus. This next week, Brother Bo will begin an interim pastorate over in Wayne County at a church called Evergreen. And the first time he went to Evergreen, I said to him, Brother Bo, I think I've preached there before. I'm almost positive I preached there. And I told him the occasion. I'll tell you what I told him. Back in Late 1978, for William Carey Day, through the BSU, I was sent to Wayne County to Evergreen Baptist Church, a little white block building that might have seated 125 people inside. I was sent over there. Now, you didn't have Siri to guide you in those days, folks. And finding this place was a challenge for life. And I drove over, I lived in Jones County at a big creek, and I got on 84, went right over to where you turn off of 84, and headed up that direction to where this church was. I preached a message, the first time I had ever preached this message in my life. I was a young man, I'd only been called to preach that year, uh, March of 78, and I was, I preached this message while I went in there, I had on my best three-piece suit. My shoes were shined as shine could be. And I stepped into that pulpit, and I pulled out the Word of God. I had my James Robinson open Bible, and I pulled out my outline. And my outline was six things God does not know. And my first point was, God does not know a sin he does not hate. As soon as I said that, now there are only two rows, and I, I, I can't run far from the camera that's on me, so I have to be close. But just imagine these are the two rows right here. And Dale, right about where you're seated, that many rows back, you and Francine, there was a woman 
And as soon as I said those words, she burst out in tears. I don't mean just tears, y'all. I don't mean just a little bit coursing down her face. She was, oh, 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 and cried all the way through my message, shoulder shaking, sobbing, all the way through the message. Her heart was restless. Finally, as we reach the invitation time, friends, seeing the woman when we stood to sing, I don't remember what the invitation was, but when we stood to sing, the woman next to her took her shoulder and shoved her out into the aisle. <laughs> didn't walk with her, didn't say, can I go down front with you? Shoved her out in the aisle, and that woman was gloriously saved on that day. How wonderful. I want to tell you, until you know Jesus, you may think it's all right, but when the Holy Spirit brings you into confrontation with Jesus, you become restless. You do. Let me get to the bottom line of this. The man who walked away from Jesus wanted peace. What must I do to e inherit eternal life? He didn't want a pardon. The young man was blind to his need for a pardon. Look at verse 21 back in our text. He said to Jesus, all these things I have kept from my youth. He was completely blind to his need for a pardon. And there are going to be times that you share the gospel with people and tell them uh, what the gospel claims, and they're going to tell you that they see themselves as basically good, and everything's going to work out in the end. The young man kept most of the commandments, but there's one the Lord hasn't mentioned yet. There's one he's held back on. In Exodus 20, verse 17, the Bible says this. Well, maybe two commandments, okay? But let me give you this first one here. Thou shalt not covet. Oh, he loved his money, didn't he? When you see him walking away in a few moments and it says he walked away sorrowful, that is the kind of word, the kind of sorrow that you feel when you get the news that one of your loved ones, your very close loved ones has died that kind of sorrow we're speaking of. He mourned the thought of letting go of his money. Some of y'all do it at offering time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't say that, did I? Jesus said in Matthew, not only is a great commandment, say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, Jesus said, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, he loved himself. Look at all the money he had. They had him trouble with self-love there, did he? Look at all that he had. There was that pride issue. Well, help the poor? Me? There was that purse issue. Give away your wealth. Let me tell you about a man named Paul Denon. Back, oh, around the year 2000. He was being interviewed, and, at, and somebody asked him what was the most important thing. Now, you've got to understand this guy. He had four cars, which is not very many, but he had four. One was a DeLorean, and another was a Jaguar, you know. And uh, he enjoyed those vehicles, and the reporter said, what about, what about your life philosophy? And Denon said, it's all about the money. And all those guys that say they want to make a difference in the world, that's a bunch of bull. That's all it is. The rich young ruler had a purse problem. For him, it was all about the money. The Lord knows what will reveal your need for a Savior. He wasn't telling him, keep all the commandments. He was trying to do what the law does, show your need that you can't keep all the commandments. And so he brings them to this last one in that moment. He knows how to reveal your need for a Savior. And if you're pleading for peace, and if you're praying for peace, then you need to come to the Prince of Peace. And 
Place your faith in him, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's where you need to begin. This young man walked away sorrowful. And the wording means he was mourning, as I said. Ladies and gentlemen, there was remorse, but no regret. There was repentance. No, there wasn't. You can be sorry, remorseful, and never repent. You can want peace, but if you don't want the Lord's pardon, you'll never have it. Search for rest for your soul if you must, but until you come to Jesus, you're not going to find it. You can be convicted and never converted. You can be religious and never truly regenerated. You can want salvation, but if you say no thank you to sanctification... I'm sorry. If you want to remain the same and not be changed into a Christ-like person, your salvation is empty. So what about you? Are you the rich young ruler? Is this you? What about you? By your heads, please. Beloved and wonderful Father in heaven, thank you for showing us and reminding us that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We seek your face now. We plead for men and women, for young people. We pray the Holy Spirit would work in our lives. If you need Christ, if you've never trusted Jesus, this morning you can do it and you can pray words like this. Father, I am a sinner and I need a Savior and I need the Holy Spirit to come into my life. I need you to forgive me. I need you to cleanse me. I believe Jesus died for my sin. And I believe that you raised him from the dead. So now I want to confess Jesus as Lord. Hear me and answer me and save me. And if you'll pray words to that effect, my Lord will save you. He will. If as a Christ follower you have lately been enamored with this present world you should repent of that you should repent of that it's your moment to do so Jim and Peggy are going across the hall and they will be in the room for counseling in adult four right across the hall and you can go tell them and they'll pray with you and if you need Christ you'll do that as well Father, do bring honor to your name in this invitation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.